Oh, fantastic. I finished the quicker, quicker video than I thought it was. There we go. I was kind of, I've got a minute to get ready. Hey guys, how are you doing? You well? Yeah. Enjoying the summer sun, everyone? Yeah, it's amazing. Ah, oh, I'm so excited to be speaking today. Uh, my name is Johnny. Uh, so if you're with us in person, but this is your first time, it's great to meet you. I'm married to Tasha, who was leading worship together. We have the, yeah, whoop for Tasha. I'm well up for whooping Tasha. I like the whooping mood we're in today, whooping and all that jazz. Um, I'm Red Sasha. Together, we've got the honor and the privilege of leading this church community. So if you're here in the room, it's your first time, or you're a guest with us, it is so great to see you. If you're watching online, it is so great to see you too. I can't remember what you, we're on this camera. Hey, it's so great to see you too. Say hello in the chat. I was chatting in the chat as lived Church London a minute ago, so feel free to say hello. And you can also click the link below the description in, in the description in the video and fill in an online connect card there. It's so great to have you with us. It's a good Sunday to be here because we're starting a brand new teaching series, a teaching series on the book of Ephesians called Sit, Walk, Stand, hence why we had the cool little opening video. And uh, I actually think I'm really excited about this teaching series on Ephesians. I think this is the perfect series to follow the teaching series we've just had. We've just had, we just spent the last four weeks doing a sex and relationships teaching series. And all the talks are on our YouTube channel. I would encourage you to check them out. If you haven't seen them already, watch them. If you've watched them already, watch them again. And the reason that it was a great series is very challenging, very hard hitting, and very focused on a particular subject. But I think this is going to be a great series because it's a follow on from that series. Even though it's got nothing, there's no direct connection between a sex and relationship series and a series on the book of Ephesians. But I think, I think the connection is most of the outcomes, most of the sort of final words of the sex and relationship series, which was called Too Hot Not to Handle, most of the outcome was sort of follow Jesus. We kind of went through a lot of stuff, we worked through a lot of stuff, we worked through the Bible, we worked through culture, we talked about different things and different ideas that influence us when it comes to sex and relationships, but the outcome seemed to be the same. The outcome seemed to be, hey, if you're single, we need to follow Jesus. If you're, if you're dating, we need to follow Jesus. If you're engaged, you need to follow Jesus. If you're married together, you need to follow Jesus. So over the next six weeks, as we go through the book of Ephesians, conveniently, there's six chapters and there's six weeks, it works perfectly. We will be asking, we'll be really looking at how do we follow Jesus and why follow Jesus? If we said the outcome of our sex relationship series is we need to follow Jesus, well, why? Why should we follow Jesus? What's good about following Jesus? What makes that an important thing to do in our lives? What benefits are there? Is it is it simply a, a kind of get out of hell free card? Is that it? We should follow Jesus because we hear there's bad alternatives if we don't. Or is there a positive reason why we should make our lives about following Jesus? And then the other question is, how do we do that? How do we follow Jesus in our day-to-day lives? So that's what we're going to be looking through over the next, over the next six weeks. Now, I'm so glad if you're in the room, I'm so glad you're with us today because the weather is nice outside and there's a temptation when it's sunny to, you know, go and have a picnic. I'm so pleased you're in the room. And if you're watching online, we're so pleased you're joining us as well. We really are. We, we're grateful you're watching live. If you're watching a replay of this, we're grateful you're watching that too. We're so glad you're here with us online. But if you are online, can I invite you to come and join us in the room? Yeah. Can I invite you to come and join us in the room? Because it's good in the room, right, guys? Yeah. Yeah, come down and join us in Shoreditch. We would love you to come. If you're in or around London, come and meet us in Shoreditch, in our venue. The reason why it is so, so, so important to gather in person is when we gather in person, we create a climate. We create a climate of faith. So what we're doing in the room right now, the reason we've been singing worship together as a community, the reason we've been praying together as a community, the reason that we sit and listen and learn um, t- from the Bible together as a community is we want to create a climate of faith together. Now, climates matter. You see, climates create transformation. I think I've used this analogy a few times, but I'm going to keep using it. If you take a bottle of water 
and you put it in the freezer and you close the freezer door and you leave it overnight and then the next day you open the freezer and take it out, that water will have changed. You don't need to add anything to it. You don't need to take any, anything away from it. You don't need to touch it at all. Simply by putting it in the climate of the freezer, the water will be transformed from a liquid to a solid because climates create transformation. Climates create transformation. You don't need to do anything. You just put it in there and it will change. But if you put it in there and then five minutes later you open the freezer and take it out again for five minutes and then five minutes after that you open the freezer again and put it back in and you keep doing that again and again and again, do you know what's going to happen? Probably nothing. There'll probably be no transformation. Maybe there'll be a little bit of transformation. Maybe there'll be a slow transformation. But the reality is it'll be insignificant. And so the reason we, we do this every single week, the reason we gather in person every single week, we would love you to, we love it online, online is great, we're so pleased you're there, but we'd love you to come here and be here in person every single week is, is we create a climate of faith. And climates create transformation and we want to be transformed by faith. Following Jesus, making the decision to follow Jesus is a personal thing. It's a decision that you make for yourself. It's a decision that I cannot make for you. I would encourage you to make a decision to follow Jesus. That's what I'd encourage you to do with your life. But I can't make you do it. We can't make you do it. It's an individual thing. But interestingly, it's not something we do alone. We, we're not designed to follow Jesus in isolation. We're, followed, we're designed to follow Jesus in community. Because when we're in community, it does create a climate, and it creates a climate of faith. And so following Jesus on your own actually isn't something that you can really do. Yeah, you make the decision on your own to follow Jesus, but to actually follow Jesus, you need others. You need community. You need to be with other people. And, and when you're with other people, we encourage you, each other. Not, not necessarily by doing much, simply by being. Simply by worshipping with one another, praying for one another, encouraging one another, spending time with one another. This creates community. This creates a climate and a climate of faith. And our faith is transformational. You being in the room, not even if you're serving on team, but simply in the room, will have an effect on other people in the room. Equally, you not being in the room will take something away from other people in the room. So it's not just for ourselves that we should be in this room and in this climate of faith so we personally experience transformation, which is a good thing. But we should be in the room so others too can experience transformation simply by us being here. So can I encourage you? We've got a six-week series now. Can, you, can I encourage you? Can I challenge you to map out the next six weeks and go, how do I make it? How do I shift my timetable and my schedule so that as much as possible I can be in the room? I can be in the room for the next six weeks. I can be there. I can be growing in this climate of faith and experiencing this climate of faith and also contributing to the climate of faith. Not being a spiritual consumer, but being a spiritual contributor. How can you do that? How can we do that? Because when we're in the room, it makes a difference. It's amazing how many people feel that, oh yeah, maybe that person being in the room makes a difference. But I don't. But you're wrong. Actually, you, every single person listening online, every single person in the room right now, we need you. Like, we need you here to help build this community and this climate of faith. So as we, as we journey through the book of Ephesians over the next, next six weeks, as we learn why we should follow Jesus and how to follow Jesus together, we would love you to be here in the room as much as humanly as humanly possible because that helps us create this climate of faith that leads to transformation okay so the book of Ephesians uh, the book of Ephesians Ephesus is the place where Paul was writing to the church the Paul is written by the apostle Paul Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus the Ephesian church um, Ephesus was a huge Greek city it was a huge city which was the center of worship for, for Greek culture and actually for Roman culture as well, there was a lot of worship going on of different gods, whether it was Greek gods or Roman gods. There was a lot of worship happening in that city. And the Ephesians church was actually having an impact to, to change that worship from the Roman gods and the Greek gods to the one true God. Um, if you want to know a bit about Paul's journey to Ephesus, you can read about it in Acts chapter 19. Again, it's quite useful to set you up 
to understand the book we're reading, uh, to read about, well, what did he do in his journey to Ephesus? What experiences was he having? What other things was happening around the same time? What else was God up to? So read about that in Acts chapter 19. Uh, Paul himself was in Ephesus for two years. So uh, the ch- he kind of launched the church. He, he planted the church. He, uh, he was there for two, he was two years, inviting people to come followers of Jesus. And then when he wrote the letter, it was actually a few years later after he, he'd left Ephesus and continued on his missionary journeys and was arrested by the Romans. And he wrote the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, while he was in prison. Um, so that's sort of a, little, a little scheme of background for you. You can find more stuff online. You can read some commentaries and learn more about the book of Ephesians. But that's what is happening around. This is what this book is all about. He was, the book of Ephesians was written to this huge center of worship, this really influential city in, uh, in the Greek culture that Paul had been in for a couple of years. And now he was writing to them to encourage them and to equip them as they follow Jesus. We're going to read. Uh, I'm going to read from the book of Ephesians. It's always a good thing to do, isn't it? It's always good to read the Bible. I'm going to read it in a moment. Uh, can I invite you to look out for two things as we read it, Okay. Well, actually, before we even invite you to look out for those two, can I just remind us, I think it's just useful to remind us that the, the Bible, which we're reading from, isn't a book about us, it's a book about God. And I just think there's a lot in our culture which tells us the Bible is a book about us. Oftentimes people treat the Bible like it's an app. You know, they, they add to their life. You know, if you, if you need an app which has a map on it, you'll download City Mapper, and then whenever you need it, you'll tap on that app on your phone and you'll use City Mapper. Oftentimes we treat our faith and the Bible as if it's an app in our lives. It's like, I'm good, everything's good. Oh no, I'm a bit lost, I need some encouragement. I'll tap on the app of the Bible, read something, and hopefully God will give me some encouragement. But when we treat the Bible like that, we're treating it as if it's a book about ourselves where it isn't a book about ourselves it's a book all about God so when we're reading this let's just bear that in mind we're reading the book of uh, Ephesians over the next six weeks let's remember that this book isn't about us this is a book all about God and so we can always ask the question well what does this teach me about who God is and then we can also say well as a result of who God is how does that affect me how does that affect my life how does that encourage me how does that help me in the situation I'm in but but remembering the first question is always what does this teach you about who God is because it's a book all about God and then as I read this passage today can I also encourage you to look for two things two things that should stand out the first is the supremacy of Jesus It talks about the supremacy of Jesus. So as I'm reading it, listen out for verses and words that really highlight the supremacy of Jesus. And then secondly, uh, look for verses that show how we can rest in his power at work in our lives, okay? So the supremacy of Jesus and how we can rest in his power at work in our lives. I'm going to read from uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. It'll be on the screen, uh, but if you want to follow along, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, 15 to 23, this is what it says. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him, uh, so you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of his heaven in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the ones to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. Right, let's pray. Father God, we just pray you will speak to us today. We will hear from you. We will know you more. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 
When I was, you're going to get a glimpse of how old I am now, guys. You'll be like, whoa, this guy is from a different century. Some of you, some of you around my age, you know who you are. But, but a lot of you will be like, whoa, this guy has grown up in a different world to me. It's like a time machine. Uh, when I was in year seven of secondary school, so I must have been like 11 or 12 years old, I remember being sat in a geography class lesson yeah it was a geography lesson in fact it was after the geography lesson for those who of, of us who weren't quick enough to get our work done in the lesson which was me consistently through the entirety of school uh, there was me and a few other kids and we had to finish our work off and we were meeting in the school library uh, that's where our geography lesson was that that difference doesn't make it doesn't influence the story but it just shows how vivid this memory is to me and you'll, you'll think, why is this memory so vivid? But it's a very clear and vivid memory I have of being in a geography lesson or after a geography lesson in school, in a library, in year seven. I went to an all-boys school, so it was me and a few other boys in the room, probably about six or seven of us. And I was sat there trying to do my geography work and not doing a great job at it. And there was two boys sat next to each other just in front of me to the right. Again, not, not important, but just to show how clear this memory is to me. And they were talking... And they were talking about something incredible, something revolutionary, something that, well, listening to their conversation must have been the best thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. And that was cable television, right? See, when I was growing up, and this is where you're going to be like, wow, Johnny, I can't even understand you anymore. I can't relate to you. When I was growing up, when I was 11, there were four TV channels Four, do you guys know that there was a time when there were only four TV channels? There was, four, there was BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, but I grew up in the north, so we called it Granada, and then Channel Four, and Channel Four was like the rebellious channel, which you watched if you were a bit crazy. Four TV channels. Channel Five didn't even exist. We didn't even have Channel Five. Not that anybody ever watches Channel Five, but we didn't even have the option. We had four TV channels, and, I was, and that's all I'd ever known. And if you wanted to watch kids' TV, it was on for a few hours in the afternoon, and that was it. And then it was followed by Neighbours. Uh, that was my life, and that was my experience growing up. Anyone, anyone, anyone shocked by this? Anyone shocked? Like, you guys looked like, did you guys know that there were only four TV channels? Did you learn about it in history? You, le you guys learned about it in history. What? <laughs> Craziness. But these two boys, who were sat on the table in front of me, were talking about cable TV because they both had cable TV. And they were talking about channels that I'd never heard of. And they were talking about shows on these, that I had never heard of on these channels that I'd never heard of. These guys were experiencing a different world and it sounded amazing, honestly. They were talking, one of them, I can't remember, I can't remember the shows or the channels, but one of them was like, oh, have you ever, do you watch such and such channel? And the other one was like, oh, yeah, such and such channel. I love such and such channel. It's amazing. Have you seen such and such on such and such channel? Oh my gosh. I love such and, oh, that is the best TV show on such and such channel. But have you seen such and such on such and such channel? Like, oh my days, I forgot about such and such on such and such channel that's even better and this was the exchange going it felt, felt like forever it, and they were just getting more and more excited about this channel I'd never heard of and this TV show I'd never heard of about and then a different channel I'd also never heard of and another telly show that I'd never heard of and it sounded incredible and I remember it so vividly because I got this overwhelming sense of not having those things of not knowing what on earth they were talking about. I've never seen those TV shows. I've never heard of those TV channels. And really feeling left out. Because I was sat on my own with no idea what they were talking about. But all I knew is it sounded great. And I didn't get to be part of it. I didn't get to be part of this club talking about these amazing things. It was something that other people had that I didn't experience. It was something that other people clearly it was making their lives so much better and they were able to talk to each other so they had a sense of belonging about this thing that was making their lives so much better and I just simply didn't have it I just didn't have it I was an outsider to cable tv and I remember going home to my mum and saying mum can we get cable tv and my mum in her Irish ways said uh, no <laughs> no we're not doing that it's stupidly expensive don't be silly and you know, I don't know, gave us, you know, 
I don't know, sent me somewhere, probably to do my homework, to watch, to watch my lowly four TV channels, like to try and watch Blue Peter before it finished and Neighbours started. Oh, what a ta- Mother, if you're watching, what a terrible upbringing I had. No, I'm really joking. It was great. I had a great upbringing. In fact, to be honest, I don't feel like... I don't feel like the joy that these guys had was real. I feel like they may be over-egging it a little bit. When we know Jesus more, we experience hope. That's what I want to talk about. When we know Jesus more, we experience hope. I was sat in that room feeling hopeless at age 11. How terrible is that? Feeling hopeless, feeling rejected, feeling like I wasn't accepted and feeling that like I was missing all the joy from my life because I didn't have TV, cable TV. I felt completely, I just felt awful after that, after that geography lesson. I felt terrible, insignificant, insignificant, like I just didn't belong. But when we know Jesus more, we experience hope. In verse 18, it says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in, in order that you may know the hope which he has called you to. Uh, The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. When we follow Jesus, we experience this hope. Not a hope that cable TV may, may give us, not a hope that some TV channel or some TV show or this experience that we don't have, that other people may have, could give us. We experience that hope only through Jesus. We experience that hope through Jesus. When we follow Jesus, we can experience that hope. Why is it good to follow Jesus? Why was the outcome of all our messages over the past four weeks when it comes to relationships that the main thing we should do is follow Jesus? That all those other things are important, yeah, and they matter, yeah, but the most important thing is we follow Jesus. It's because it is only in Jesus we get our hope. We won't get it through our relationships. We won't get it through, through a, a hookup. We won't get it through a feeling. We won't get it through doing this or doing that. We won't get it through cable TV. We only get our hope through Jesus. We know Jesus more. We experience hope. We need hope. This world needs hope. If the last two years, two and a half years have taught us anything, if it's taught us anything at all, surely that we need hope. And the things that we had been putting our hope in as a culture, they disappeared. And our hope disappeared with it. Many people have put their hope in their job. Many people have put their hope in their job title. Many people put their hope in, in the, the, the things they did, the experience they had day to day, the people they hung out with, the, the, the cool nightclubs or venues or restaurants they went to. It's like, I do this. I belong. I go to this place and it makes me cool. Therefore, I am cool. Like, I, I can have this in my life. Isn't it great? And then suddenly the whole world closed down and we all went on furlough and all our jobs disappeared and our job titles paused and we couldn't go to that fancy restaurant anymore. We couldn't do that thing anymore. We couldn't hang out with those people anymore. Everything that we had been putting our hope on as a, as a world, as a culture, disappeared and it was gone because really it, it wasn't worthy of our hope. It didn't give us hope. It didn't give us everlasting hope. It gave us something superficial at best. Getting cable TV, which we got a couple of years later. My mum would want me to tell you that. We did get our cable TV. And you know what? When we got cable TV, I was so excited. And the guy fitted the box because he used to get a box and it went on top of the big TVs. Not these little skinny, thin TVs, a big fat TV. And there was a box on top of it and there was loads of channels. And it was nowhere near as good as I hoped it would be. All these channels, all these little rubbishy channels, which I, didn't heard, I hadn't heard of. The reason I hadn't heard of them is they were terrible. And all these shows I'd never heard of, the reason I hadn't heard of them, because they were awful TV shows, it was awful. There was no hope to be found in it. But I thought there was, but there wasn't. It was empty. It was an empty promise at best. But there is hope to be found in Jesus. So why should we follow Jesus? Because that is where we get authentic hope. And why was I talking about the re- the coming, we should come every single week if we can to gather in person in the room rather than only watching online? Uh, why it's so much better to be in the room, even though we're grateful you are online, why it's so much better is because it creates a climate of faith. A climate of faith in who? In Jesus. And what do we get from Jesus? We get authentic hope. When we gather together, on a regular basis, when we worship together, pray together, encourage one another, we create this climate of faith and this climate of faith is based on something real. 
not on something fleeting, not on an empty promise, not on something that looks like it could be good, but once you, once you get cable TV, it's not actually that good. It's based on something authentic. It gives us a real hope. When we know Jesus more, we experience hope. When we know Jesus more, we receive our inheritance. When we know Jesus more, we receive our inheritance. Right, let me explain very, very briefly and probably, you know, without any, any sort of scholarly words at all, but let me explain to you what this whole Christianity thing is about in a nutshell. I'll miss out a lot, and so please don't write any letters, but, but basically what happened is God created the world. God who, God who exists outside of time, so our God who exists outside, outside of our time created time which is pretty mind-blowing in itself. He created time, then he created the heavens, and he created the earth. He made it all. And he created, you know, he created all the planets, all the stars, all the physics-type stuff, which I don't even understand, like neutrinos, whatever those are. He created it. He put it all into place. He made it, and he made it incredibly well. He made plants. He made animals. He made birds, which flew in the sky. He made fish that swim in the sea. He made really weird creatures that live at the very bottom of the oceans. It's very odd. Uh, if, you're, if you've got kids like I do, you watch a program called Octonauts, and you learn about these weird, weird creatures. Uh, and God made them, and he made them all. And he made all these different plants, and plants that do different things, and some plants that eat animals, which is nuts. And he, did, he made all these things. And then he made people. Then he made humans. He made you and I, but he made us differently to the way he made everything else because everything else was good. He made it really well and it's incredible and it's so inspiring and the more you learn about it, the more creation reveals God's majesty, but, but he made humans differently. He made us differently. He made us in his image and his likeness is what it says. So everything else he made, he just made, but us he made special. He made us like him in his image and his likeness. And he, and he created a paradise for us to live in. If you read about it in the first few books of Genesis, it was a place called Eden, a garden called Eden, where all our needs were provided for. And we could just live. And the first two people, according to Genesis, were Adam and Eve. And they just lived in the Garden of Eden. They had no worries, no problems. They didn't have to work. They, they, they were free, completely free, truly free. And there was just one rule. There was just one rule in this paradise. Don't eat from the tree in the, mi in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only thing they couldn't do. They could do whatever else they wanted. But of course, humans being humans, they were tempted by the enemy. They were tempted by a snake, it says, who, who got them, who tricked them into eating the apple. Or, well, it didn't even say apple. Eating the fruit from the middle of the tree, we just assume it was apple. I don't know, because we go alphabetical order. A, first fruit, apple, there we go. Um, they eat from the tree they were told not to eat from. They rebelled against God. In fact, the way that the enemy, the, say, the snake, got them to eat from the tree of good and evil was to get them to doubt God. And, and he actually said, if you eat from this tree, you'll be like God. But if you remember, we were made in God's image and likeness. We were already made different to everyone else. We were already like God because we were made in his image and likeness. But he said, oh, if you do this, you'll be more like God. He tricked us to doubt God and make us think that God was, didn't want the best for us. And actually, we rebelled. Now, uh, whether, whether it was Adam and Eve or whether it was you and me in that garden, we'd have all done the same thing. We'd all failed. We'd have all sinned. And sin came into the world. And because of sin, because God is a God, is perfect, he is holy, he could not be close to sin. Which, so this sin created a separation between us and God and we had to leave the garden and we had to toil, we had to work to exist and we were distanced from God. But God is good, and God is loving and God, even though he created this perfect place for us and he created us in his image and likeness and then we were the ones who rebelled against him God had a rescue plan. And what happened was he ended up stepping out of heaven. So God, who was on his throne in heaven, whatever that looked like, stepped off his throne, stepped out of heaven and was born as a human being. He was born as one of us, a normal human being. Uh, but not to like the emperor of Rome or to the president or to the queen, not a rich, like privileged person, just as a, as a normal human being. So he was fully God, but at the same time, fully human and this human being's name was Jesus. And this human being, Jesus, God on earth, uh, lived a perfect life, didn't do anything wrong, didn't rebel at all, and then was killed, crucified on a cross for 
even though he was blameless. And the reason he died on that cross was to take all our sin and all our failures and all our rebellions and all our shame away. And he got rid of it and then he conquered death, rose again after three days and reascended to be with his father in heaven. You see, this is crazy, right? Because we're the ones who rebelled, yet he's the one who paid the price to save us. Isn't that incredible? That's why we gather as well, guys, because we have been given this gift. Um, And then Jesus went back up to heaven to be with his father, and from then the church was created, and that's where we are with the book of Ephesians. But we receive our inheritance because Jesus didn't just wash us clean. Jesus didn't make it so we weren't, you know, uh, I've got, you know, you sinned, you rebelled, you did something wrong, but I've cleaned that off now, so you're, you're back to where you were. In many ways, he made us, he made us heirs. He made us heirs. He, we were adopted into God's family. We get to call God Father when we pray because we're part of his family. This is mind-blowing to me. It makes no sense that that even, even though we were the ones who rebelled and did things wrong, God has made us part of his family. That's, inc- that's mind-blowing. That is acceptance beyond I, what I can understand. That's acceptance, and you may have noticed this, beyond what I can articulate. Like, I can't describe how incredible that acceptance is. I can't describe how phenomenal it is, how groundbreaking it is that you and I, in spite of whatever we have done or not done, whatever we've seen or not seen, whatever we've been or haven't been, in spite of our experiences, in spite of our sins, in spite of our rebellion, in spite of everything we've ever done, God has made us as he's, he's put us, he's adopted us into his family. That is an incredible level of acceptance. So as we follow Jesus, as we know Jesus more, we receive our inheritance. Not an inheritance we've ever earned or an inheritance we deserve, but we are an inheritance we are given by God. So why should we follow Jesus? Well, we experience a real hope and we receive our inheritance. And when we know Jesus more, we rest in his great power. As we know Jesus more, we rest in his great power. Verse 19 says this, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. When we follow Jesus, we rest in his great power. Now, what does that look like? As a kid, I thought that might mean that I could fly. For some reason, that seemed cool to me. In fact, it's still cool to me. I don't know what I'm saying. As a kid, I wanted to fly. I want to fly now. And so maybe I thought maybe the power that I got I could, meant that I could, you know, Superman to school and fly and it'd be really or like do amazing things do miracles but not for God's glory to make me look cool like that's what I thought the power might look like but I don't think that's how the power looks like I had an experience of God's power once well I've had uh, quite a few experiences of God's power I've been very uh, it's, it's been a real privilege to witness God do things but at one time it must have been maybe 14 years ago 15 years ago me and my friends uh, we were living in Liverpool we started going out every Thursday night to pray for Liverpool. And uh, so it was just me and two other friends and we met together and we'd been talking, we'd been moaning about the church and how the church does nothing because that's what you do. You're like, oh, the church should be doing this, the church should be doing that. And then one of my friends who's much wiser than I am said, well, you know, if we are the church, because like the church is in the building, uh, if we do something, then the church is doing something. So maybe we should stop moaning and do something. And he's like, okay, okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> So we did. We started meeting up every Thursday night to go out and walk the streets of Liverpool and pray. And as we walked the streets of Liverpool and Liverpool City Centre, we, we would just ask God to kind of guide us. And it'd just be like, it wasn't like super intellectual. It wasn't like there were, you know, like fingers from heaven going, go this way. Or it wasn't like, let's read the Bible. Or the Bible says that we should go up this street. It was just sort of like, oh, I just feel like, should we, which way should we go? Should we go this way? Yeah, let's go this way. And we just kind of walk around Liverpool. It wasn't super holy or anything like that and we pray as we walked and invariably we'd meet people who were homeless as we were walking around the streets of Liverpool at night we'd meet people who were homeless someone would ask us for spare change someone would uh, be selling the big issue and we realised pretty quickly it's you can't really be prayer walking the streets of Liverpool and then go no sorry I'm not helping you who are hungry so we went to Tesco and bought loads of sandwiches and started giving out sandwiches. And then after a few weeks, we got a bit more organized because that was quite expensive. We started making sandwiches and then we'd always go to like 
prime Arnie and buy some you know, underwear and socks and some toiletries, things that people might need on the streets. And when we went out uh, prayer walking every Thursday, someone would say to us, oh, you know, have you got any spare change? And we'd go, well, we haven't got spare change, but we've got some sandwiches, we've got some socks, we've got some things. We, can, we try to do something tangible and actually make a difference. That's not the story of, of seeing God's power. But one day, one day we were out and we must have been doing it for, this must have been like two or three years into doing this every single week and we were walking around the streets of Liverpool and it was the first time this had happened we didn't bump into anybody like not a single homeless person at all we didn't bump into anybody and like we even knew where people hung out so we got to know the streets pretty well by now so we've gone to a few places to try and find so we didn't bump into anyone so we just we've been walking for maybe an hour or two so we just sat down outside the Adelphi Hotel in Liverpool City Centre if you know Liverpool at all on a bench and we were just kind of chatting and catching up and doing a bit of praying. And some lads came over to us. And we were just sat on this bench. There were three of us, there were three of them, and they came over. Now, these were lads who, I don't think this is politically incorrect, but we call them scallies in Liverpool. I don't know whether that, does that mean anything to you guys? They were scallies, scallywags, right, right scallywags. Uh, they were big guys who obviously went to the gym. They had shaved heads because that was the, the, the dress code of being a scally in those days. And they were very, very scouts. You wouldn't understand them. You would have no, unless you were from Liverpool, you wouldn't understand what they're saying. And even if you were from Liverpool, subtitles would have been useful. They were very, very, very scouts. And they came over. And one of them, the biggest one, and for some reason I was sat in the middle, which was my own mistake, uh, came over to me. And he was like, I'll, I'll try and give you a glimpse of the scouts. And it's like, Hey lad, which means, excuse me, good sir. Hey lad, have you seen my phone? It's like, so excuse me, good sir, have you seen my mobile phone? And uh, I was like, oh, sorry, man, I haven't seen it. It's like, I left it here. I was like, oh, no, I haven't seen it. I'm so sorry. It's like, you've taken it, haven't you? It's like, no, I haven't seen your mobile phone. And then he got really angry. Something switched and he started, started saying words which I won't even say. But they were rude words, let me tell you. And he was screaming in my face with a very scouse accent, very aggressive, telling me, you've taken my phone, give me my phone. And then he was like, no, give me your phone. Give me your phone and screaming in my face, go, give me your phone. Give me, please, good sir, give me your mobile phone, was what he was saying in essence. And he was getting aggressive and he got right into my face a few, like really close. For some reason he pulled his T-shirt off to show me that he was ripped and he was ripped, which... <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, but it's like, well, I was already intimidated and you know what, those muscles have made me even more intimidated. He was screaming in my face. And this wasn't a good situation. Now, if you know me, you know that I can't multitask. I can do one thing at a time. But God gave me the gift of being able to multitask, which is a bit of his power. Um, so I, I was talking to this guy. I was explaining what we were doing. I said, we were Christians, we're praying. We've got some, I haven't got your phone. Would you like a sandwich? And uh, he didn't want a sandwich. In fact, that didn't seem to help the situation. But anyway, but at the same time, I was praying. And I can't multitask, but I was praying. I remember clearly just going, God, we need your protection right now. We need your protection right now. Please be with me. Please give me the words to say. Help me calm this situation down. Send your angels. Send legions of angels. This guy's got a six pack. Please help me out, God. <laughs> and then suddenly something happened. One of them, one of the two on the side, grabbed the one in the middle. was like, we've got to go. We've got to go. Or we've We've got to leave. We've got to go. And he's like, no, mate, I'm getting my phone off this one. I don't know I picked on you, Andy. Sorry about that. Get my phone off this one. And uh, he's like, no, we've got to go. And then the guy looked up. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got to go. And they all turned and they all ran. And then about 10 meters away, the guy in the middle, the one who'd been in my face, stopped, turned around, came back and said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And shook my hand. And then they all ran away. Like, this is a weird experience. Now, as I said, there wasn't anyone around, but I, stu I stood up expecting like maybe a security guard from the hotel to have walked out or maybe a police car to, to have pulled in because it has one of those drive, uh, driving things at the front of a hotel and, you know, there to be police there or something. But there was no one. There was no one around. And even if there was police, why would he come back and say sorry? Like, why would he do that? That makes no sense. I, the only thing I can surmise was God showed up. Maybe an angel appeared behind me. Like not one of those angels with tinsel around the head like you see in a kid's nativity, like an angel with a fiery sword. And like, that's the only thing I can think happened because they ran away and they were bigger than us and they were scarier than us and they ran away. And I just wonder whether like when they were running away, he's like, ah, 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 say you're sorry. And that's why he came back. Because I can't think of any other explanation for what happened. But 
we were, we were following Jesus. We were doing what Jesus had called us to do. We were being obedient to Jesus. And that's what I think resting in his power looks like. It's not about us being able to have superpowers. It's not about us being able to do magic tricks for people. It's simply that as we follow Jesus, God empowers us to keep going. And when danger comes, when difficult situations come, we have got strength from following Jesus. Isn't that incredible? So I want to encourage you today to follow Jesus. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus for yourself before, as I said earlier, it's an individual decision that you and you alone can make. I can't make it for you. But can I encourage you to follow Jesus? It's the greatest decision you can make. But following Jesus isn't just a one-off thing we do. It's a day-in, day-out commitment. It's something we do every single day. We follow Jesus, we follow Jesus, we follow Jesus. But when we follow Jesus, we discover real hope real hope when we follow Jesus we receive our inheritance we're adopted into his into God's family when we follow Jesus we can rest in his power his great power he'll help us out and you know what that means that means that that means that if you're like oh, I really feel like I should invite my friend my housemates come to church one day but they are like they they are so against it they, they're a, they hate the church they're a big atheist they're never going to come but God's power means that, that you rest in, means that if you invite them, they may well say yes. God's power means that if you feel like you should be generous to someone, someone you know is like, uh, we've, we've, we had a new baby born at Lucy Church yesterday, we were super excited about. Uh, we, so we're celebrating a brand new baby as part of our church family. And every time a baby's born, we do a thing where we, we, uh, we, where we just say, hey, if you'd like to give, uh, to the care fund through the website you can and we're going to go and buy some uh, M&S food and give it to new mummy and new daddy because when you're new mum and new dad it's tiring and just really bless them as part of our church community and maybe you're like ah oh, that sounds like a great idea blessing people who've just had a child but I can't I haven't got the money to but God's power means that if you pray about it and you feel God's telling you to give and if he says give X amount of money you can know that his power will back you up you won't be short you won't be broke he will it's just how God works. That's how his power works. So I want to encourage you to follow Jesus. So there's two responses today. In fact, can we stand? I think it'd be good to get the blood flowing a little bit. There's two things I want to encourage you in today. The first is if you are a Christian, if you are already a Christian and you follow Jesus, can I encourage you today to real, to, I don't know, to grab hold of that truth again to grab hold the tr of the truth that following Jesus is incredible and it's what we were actually designed to do. And we were designed to do it in the context of community. And say, so, okay, from today, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna grab hold of that truth. I'm gonna prioritize it again. I'm gonna be there on Sundays. I'm gonna go to community group. I'm gonna get up at six, for 6.45 a.m. to join the online prayer meeting every day. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna walk with my community. I'm gonna encourage my community I'm going to be part of my community because I'm going to take this thing of following Jesus I'm going to make it the most important thing in my life and if you've not if you've not done that for a while can I encourage you to do that today and just as we're worshiping God in a moment just to say God I'm just want to help, help me to follow you and the second thing is if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus today whether you're watching online or you're in the room I want to give you the opportunity to make that decision I want to give you the opportunity today to say yes I want to follow Jesus now as I said it's a lifelong journey and this is just the first step but you take the first step by saying yes you take the first step by saying yes I want to do this and so if you'd like to follow Jesus you've never made that decision before or maybe you have but it's been a long time and you want to make it again as if it's the first time I'm going to ask you in a moment to put your hand up so if everyone could kind of close their eyes for me by the heads if you'd like to follow Jesus today, make that decision. I will pray for you and with you now. Do you want to just put your hand up for me? Just put your hand up so I know who I'm praying for. Just pop your hand up. Oh, that's great. Good job. Fantastic. And if you're online, you can do this too. I'm just going to pray for you. And this is you making that decision. This is you starting the journey of following Jesus. I'm just going to pray. Father God, Today, we're choosing to follow Jesus. We're choosing to make him number one in our lives. We're choosing to chase after him. 
We want to go where He wants us to go. We want to do what He wants us to do. We want to live the life that He's got planned for us. We want to say no to our own selfish desires and say yes to Him. God, as we start this journey, help us. Help us to walk in hope. To know that we receive an inheritance from you and to to rest in your great power. Help us to be Christians today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Just last thing before we go back into worship. If you made that decision today, whether you put your hand up or not, or whether you're watching online or not, please let us know. Please, if you're in the room, come and chat to me afterwards. We want to give you a gift of a Bible. And if you're watching online, please go to the online connect card in the description below the video. And you can, even if you filled that out before, fill out again, but tick the box that says, I made the decision to follow Jesus. Because we want to send you via our friends at Amazon a Bible. You may have a hundred Bibles already. You may have more Bibles than you have, you know what to do. If we want to give you a new Bible to mark the day. And you can write the day's date in it and say, that day was the day that I made the decision to follow Jesus. Because there'll be difficult days ahead. There will be. It's life. But you can always look back and go, aha, that's when I made the decision to follow Jesus and to discover a hope that is real and authentic for my life. Let's worship God together. Amen.